Hello and welcome to the Sea Realm Podcast. I'm your host, KMO, and this is episode number 129. An affirmation of your own sanity. Prepared for release onto the World Wide Web on Wednesday, November 19th, 2008. And in this installment of the Sea Realm Podcast, I will be playing the final portion of my conversation with Michael Tesserion. And while it is the third installment, it really represents the second half of my conversation with Michael Tesserion. And what's more, this is really the uh, the meat of the material, the the real heart of what I was hoping to get from Michael Tesserion when I first invited him to participate here on the Sea Realm Podcast. And uh, I know that some people had a bad reaction to the the very first dose of Michael Tessarian that they got and are not so inclined to give him any more time, but I would encourage you to do so because in this episode you are going to hear what I heard the day that I first spoke to him and what I've really been looking forward to sharing with you ever since. But before I do that, I would like to thank the folks who made a financial contribution to the Sea Realm podcast and helped me offset the ongoing costs of bringing you these podcasts week after week. I have one contributor to thank. It is Timo V, or maybe it's Timo V. I apologize for the mispronunciation. Uh, this week's new subscribers also present me with some pronunciation challenges. I've got Anar P, or perhaps it's Enar P, and Tadig R and Max T. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Max T. Max T was the one who actually suggested that I create the uh, the PayPal subscription option in the first place. And Max has made many very generous contributions to the Sea Realm podcast in recent months. And I would say that he has sponsored several lifetime memberships for uh, subscribers to the Sea Realm podcast. So for those of you who have been listening for a long time and have felt bad because you have not been in a position to contribute financially to the Sea Realm podcast, don't worry. Max has got your back. He's got it covered. Well, as I mentioned, this is the uh, final segment, but really it is the bulk of the material that I have to share with you from Michael Tessarion. And for some people, uh, that is not a good thing. They're thinking, oh, I'm glad it's almost over, but I'm not going to listen to this episode. Really, I would encourage you to listen to this episode. Last week, I read some email from people who were not very happy with my choice of guests in inviting Michael to Sarion, and now I'd like to share something that I received this week from Jedwin. I'm not going to read the whole email, but uh, in the middle he writes, I really, really like Michael to Sarion. Always have, and probably always will. I also realize that there are those who don't. Kind of obvious, don't you think? And honestly, I'm fine with that. Each person should be able to decide who, what moves them and who, what doesn't. My concern is when these dissenters alter the way a guest is handled or portrayed. What I'm trying to say is I think you may have cut the session with Michael Tessarion short last week to appease the naysayers, and I'm afraid you might do the same this week. This would personally be very disappointing. I look forward to the three weeks of Tessarion even if others can't take five minutes of him. I try to listen to the guests on yours and other shows with an open ear, regardless of my personal opinions about them. Each speaker usually has a well thought out point and has backed up their efforts by authoring books like Tessarion and other venues for getting their ideas out, like podcasts and conferences, etc. And though this doesn't make them someone to be in awe of or blindly followed, they do deserve credit for their work, efforts, and scholarship. At least they have the courage to put themselves out there for criticism. Instead of catering to people who don't like a certain guest, how about suggesting they write a few books, speak at several conferences, and maybe make a good YouTube video or DVD for sale, and then you can have them on as a guest. Better yet, accept their displeasure with a guest selection, but move on as you decided. The publishing slash entertainment slash education industries don't eat people up because they actually have a large creature that eats people. Instead, people slowly conform to the wishes of others till their original vision is lost. And Jedwin, uh, first, I have cut nothing of the Michael Tessarion material that I had planned to share originally. Uh, it's all there. And secondly, what you say there at the end, that uh, people basically police themselves, particularly in the media, that is absolutely true and very much in line with the topic of conversation that you'll be hearing with Michael Cesarion in just a moment. Finally, for those of you who still don't like Michael Cesarion and don't care to uh, listen to any more of him, 
There is a one and a half hour interview that I recorded with Ayasmina. You can find it on the Internet Archive, and you can find a link to it in the show notes for this episode, which, as always, you can find on my blog, kmo.livejournal.com. Also, in the show notes, I will be printing Jedwin's email in full, along with a note of support for Michael Cesarion that I received from Neil Kramer. So you can find those in the show notes for this episode. It's episode 129 on my blog, kmo.livejournal.com. You're listening to the C-Realm Podcast. C stands for Consciousness. You're listening to the Sea Realm Podcast. I'm your host, KMO, and joining me here again in the Sea Realm from his undisclosed but secure location somewhere in Europe is author, researcher, and filmmaker Michael Tessarion. Michael, welcome back to the Sea Realm Podcast. Nice to be back, KMO. Thank you. And when last we talked, we were talking about tyranny. And no tyrant in history, I mean, tyrants are, are well known for using violence against the people that they rule and control. But no tyrant in history has ever had resources or access to the, uh, you know, the, the apparatus of violence to control and compel an unwilling population. It has to be psychological tyranny at root in order to be effective. And I know you've spoken on that at length and written on that in great depth. And if you would, just share with the Sea Realm audience why you think it is that uh, the study of psychology, a real and meaningful study of psychology, is something that absolutely must be denied to a people who will be controlled and who will be the, uh, the subjects of tyranny. Oh, you're right. That's absolutely the bottom line, you know. And it's not just uh, their detractors who've tried to expose them. They themselves are happy to tell you. The great, uh, you know, uh, Klaus, whether you're dealing with Clausewitz or Sun Tzu or Machiavelli, you know, or even, uh, I mean, in recent times, you know, the Brzezinskis who've written the Grand Chessboard, you know, all my DVDs, all my work refers you time and time again to their own works. And what you said is absolutely correct. You, you find the same refrain over and over again. They are not really concerned if you want to wallow around and sling mud at them inside the uh, muddy pen that they've created. In fact, that's why they created it. They don't mind a good mud wrestle. They don't mind, you know, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, color wallpaper you put on the inauthentic life. They're all for it. They provide that. But they also make it clear in their own works what they do not want to see happening. They're afraid of an awakening. They're afraid of, uh, of uh, psychological empowerment. And it basically can be understood that they're not really afraid of good people. That's why we have a lot of good people still in the world. But see, what they understand, you've got to understand the, the uh, thinking of these people in order to really, you know, f get a grip on what they're, what they're about and, and why they do the strange, bizarre, inhuman things that they do. And that is that they're not afraid of good people as long, camo, as long as those good people are ignorant. Because sadly, a good person can, in fact, be ignorant. In fact, a good person can be stupid. A good person can be uninformed. An evil person, that means an immoral, unjust, unvirtuous, and even unsane person, a psychopath, can be highly knowledgeable. In fact, anyone who's got background in psychology knows that, sadly, the psychopaths of the world tend to be very knowledgeable. They are very, very you know, skilled uh, at what they do. They're um, the psychopath, the... Um, the person who is uh, pathologically see is an expert liar. This is what you find out with these outer directed hypermanic types of individuals, unfortunately. So the good person is stronger when he's educated. And he's particularly strong if he's educated in psychology. And so therefore there's been a campaign in the movies. There's been a campaign uh, in, even in the New Age movement. There's all sorts of little campaigns you see out there to dumb down people, but also to give you a false impression about psychology. Uh, the American media, for instance, always referring to psychologists as shrinks. And then you get, you know, your listeners will go, oh, no, Michael, you're totally wrong. Look at all the new age self-help spinner, spinner rack. Look how vogue it became. But then we're talking about, well, what kind of psychology are we talking about? Are we really talking about the Carl Jung's and the Freud's and the R.D. Lang's, you know, and uh, the Ar Arno Gruen's and the Alfred Adler's and the Karen Horney's and the Carl Rogers? You see, are we talking about the heavyweights here? Or are we talking about some spinner rack self-help gobbledygook 
that is again meant to be some sort of you know decoration for your inauthentic life, uh, which might in fact serve to make you a very one-dimensional kind of person, which is in itself an escape, which is in itself a drug, which is in itself you know um, a decoration of the inauthentic life that's not really going to the root of the of the questions. So again, we have a question there about the kind of information in the New Age movement. Some of it is good, but some of it is not good. Some of it is just pacification, bromides. You know, so again, this has all been put in front of people as a sort of counterfeit psychology. I mean, psychology has just basically, basically got a bad rap. It wasn't like that at one point, uh, you know, but it has become like that. And then people have got off on this tangent of the New Age movement, which I think muddies the water significantly. I mean, most of my work, you see, or a good deal of my work is with the Western magical tradition. When we talk about astrology, we you know uh, look at the origins of the tarot and the divination hermetic arts. And I always uh, emphasize in, in that particular area of my work that what we're talking about here is the Western magical tradition. It's not necessarily the same thing as the Eastern magical tradition. You know, it, it, in fact, Carl Jung also spoke about that, that there may be, in fact, incompatibility between Eastern understandings of, of, of um, spirituality and Western understandings of spirituality. They may not, in fact, be the same, and, and, and they're not the same. And today what we see also arising in the, in the New Age movement or in the sort of new hippiedom in which you find a lot of uh, the technical people, you know, uh, prophesizing the one world order and global oneness and all of these kinds of things. These people are very, very uh, often apt to uh, or want to, you know, quote from the Dalai Lama or drop in anecdotes from what appears to be Eastern mysticism. And the danger with this is people start glowing all over, think, oh, how wonderful, how prophetic. You know, and they'll drop terms like uh, nirvana, and they'll drop all of these Eastern terms, you know, in order to uh, bolster some of their own insidious philosophy. So again, you're right. The person who's not empowered, who hasn't looked into these matters, is 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 gullible and can be easily led by those who know how to, you know, drop these talismanic words and to uh, basically uh, make people feel that they're talking about something that's very authentic. And there's a great danger in that, you see. You mentioned that the movies, and I guess pop culture in general, has served to uh, sort of obscure the, the necessary knowledge of, uh, of psychology that would allow people to better resist attempts at psychological tyranny. But I know at the same time you also believe that there have been messages in pop culture, there have been messages in movies and in you know, popular music that uh, are revealing of the control, the control structure. And there are messages there in these, you know, big corporate produced uh, entertainment packages that really point the way toward a sort of personal liberation. And if you would talk about that. Well, you're, I want to emphasize, I want to qualify what we said and also your, your first part of your question. If people, for instance, the first movie maker uh, of distinction who made movies specifically to deal with psychological themes was Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, he even dedicated, I think, at least two of his movies um, to the psychoanalytical movement. And his movies were made specifically in order to get people to be okay with psychoanalysis and psychology. Every one of those movies was a complete box office failure, whether it was Vertigo or, I think, Suspicion, you see. Um, and the other two, he made four that were on psychology specifically. Then he goes and makes Psycho. And it's a blockbuster. So this should tell people something. Uh, you know, even though Psycho, I must add, did have certain psychological elements. But those were secondary to the, you know, the slash, bang, horror, you know, uh, elements. And so that was a super success. The ones that emphasized the psychology, people were just walking out there going, oh, my God, what was that? I'm so glad that's over. <laughs> you know, they made fun of Montgomery Clift when he went and tried to consult a psychologist. And they said, oh, he's going for his shrink. And you're right, in pop culture, they, they've, they've done played it a lot. And movies and, and documentaries that have tried to uh, put it in a good light, you know, people just haven't simply liked it at all. It, not to mention, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't, you know, gone to a second level within the movies. There are other filmmakers, lesser popular, not, not the mainstream, who've dealt beautifully with the subject and they've made wonderful movies and so forth and so on. But we're talking about on the whole here, to the mass, to the masses, it's been presented terribly. And, and, um, then to answer your second part of your question, which is that the, the pop culture also now has, you know, very empowering motifs. Absolutely. And that's so true. And it continues. 
Uh, one only has to look at you know Google and, and MySpace and, and YouTube to see some really liberating and brilliant things, both from a creative point of view, from a countercultural point of view, from a critical point of view, uh, you know, emerging. Uh, uh, B movies or, or what do you independent films you see have tremendous potential, you know. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of hope there. I mean, even big movies. There's elements within even big movies that are just fantastic. You know, like the Truman Show and uh, the Matrix, the Star Trek movies, and so forth and so on. You know, the, all the time there's some really excellent stuff coming out there. And if people are even are more familiar with how to read the subtext, I think they're very enlightening. You know, they're very very enlightening films. Well, what what are some uh, some basic techniques in in ferreting out the subtext? Oh yeah, well you see this is then what uh, we refer to as either pattern recognition or symbolic literacy. For a beginner, one of the interesting things to do before they lack, before they gain uh, more esoteric knowledge, because of course what we're talking about then will eventually take you into an esoteric occult field. There's nothing frightening about that. It just means that which is normally hidden. Just the it's like a how I started myself. Pattern recognition. I, I would notice the same motifs appearing in many areas. You know, like it's sort of like certain numbers. For instance, the number 23. Obviously, on the show, we don't have time to go into the, the meaning of the number 23 and all its permutations. But just to answer your question, the number 322. You know, like an enemy of the state. And in various other films, um, there's a list of them. Uh, you will find that a, a character in a movie will look at his watch and they'll say 322. Or well, they'll be walking past some sort of a you know, um, uh, door and you'll maybe have the number 322. Or you'll see it on a, a person's t-shirt in another movie. And we're not talking the same movie here. We're talking about a wide spectrum of different movies. The number 23 has been noted, and I might add, been noted by film critics. Not from people in any form of alternative movement, but from people who even study film have noted that the number 23 seems to appear, you know, time and time and time again in, in, in movies dating even from the 1950s right up to the modern era. There's been movies which show skulls, skulls and bones, pyramids. You know, we have information on the websites about this. If people go to the forum or they come to, um, if they go to the forum, actually, I have a uh, section on my forum which is um, a page that's called Symbolism. So you just click on that link. It says symbolism and go in there and you'll have a bunch of links there proving what I'm talking about. Clips from films, you know, cutouts from films and from ad copy and so forth. I've even done a DVD on it showing these recurring motifs. So before you even know what they are or before you even get around, you know, why they might be doing it, just notice it. Just take a note of the fact that this is done. Then on a little bit more subtle level, you want to start looking at how light is used. We, we, we tend to see it's so ubiquitous we forget about it. How is light used in media? Uh, what are the most common symbols and colors that are being used? How is the father, uh, the image of the father, presented to us now? And has that changed since it was first brought into advertisement in the 1950s? How has it evolved? How are mothers shown? How are black people shown as opposed to white you know, characters in, in movies? How is the dork shown? You know, the nerd. So it's pattern recognition. It's about how are these stereotypes being portrayed, you know? How is the jock being shown? How are women being shown? Why are so many women headless in ad copy? Meaning that, you know, their heads are out of the shot. Uh, or why is it that they are shown in a sort of recumbent and almost deathly like pose, you see? Again, you'll see this not in one place, but in multiple places. How are children being shown? How are animals being shown? Are there any movies out there that really show a positive relationship to animals? Or, or, or do we like the movie when it's cute because the animal is shown anthropomorphically, meaning uh, you know, that we've, we've added uh, some human elements to it? So uh, how is nature shown? Why is it that so many slasher, horror, uh, you know, Friday the 13th, Halloween type movies always have the thunder and the moon you know, and, and the trees having the sinister element? Is there something positive in that to make children frightened to death? of nature, that nature harbors some sort of, you know, spiritual evil, you know? So we have, we have a communication, subtextual communication going on here that needs to be analyzed. And to me, that's as fascinating as just the entertainment value of, of the piece that's being created. That's good, and I'm all for it, and one, one wants to laugh, and one wants to be entertained, and one wants some downtime, you know? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not against TV at all. I am not a favor of these critics who talk about turning off the TV and, you know, and getting rid of your TV. Not at all. I want to make critics out of my uh, audience, not cynics. 
And I, I don't believe that going cold turkey on anything is ever going to solve the problem. You must know about the world. You must study the world. You must know all the elements that are in it. And then you must come to your own conclusions about it. For some people, if that means they do want to get rid of their television, by all means. For those who say, no, I want to keep studying it because I'm interested in keeping abreast of what's coming on, and I've put my filters up there so I'm not being, you know, uh, attacked by some of the garbage that comes over, then that person totally is to be endorsed. That's fine. There's multiple ways of, of addressing this information. Some people won't even say, I want to pick up a camera and do my own stuff. I'm sick of this rubbish. Let me, you know, and that's pretty much where I'm coming from, is let me pick up my own camera and go and do, you know, uh, my own uh, programs and DVDs and whatnot. So it's, it's, it's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be fearful. But just like an art critic goes around a gallery and looks at all the different motifs and looks at all the different elements and studies the colors and, and, the, and the beauties, you know, why did Van Gogh do, you know, multiple, two dozen, a dozen, three dozen images of just the sunflowers? Why did Rembrandt paint, you know, himself at least a dozen times, his own portrait, you know? There's a fascinating story to be told in the realm of art. And it's also very enriching because, of course, you're dealing with the right brain. You're dealing with man's unconscious. And words do not have any um, impact on the right brain nor on man's unconscious. Or at least they do not have as much impact as images, words, colors, numerology, and vibration, you see. So this is something that people also need to be aware of, is that we have a, a, a tyranny out there that... Uh, people who are members of Dionysian cults, ancient societies, highly versed in symbolic uh, communication, who may be communicating to your subconscious, not maybe, are doing it. My work insists that this is happening. It is a phenomenon that's taking place. And on a daily basis, maybe insinuating, you know, ideas, memes, and messages into your unconscious by passing your conscious circuitry. And therefore, that, of course, when if, if you were to accept that that was happening, you'd be in the position where you'd have to become immune to it. You'd have to raise filters to that. And so my work is very much about diagnosing this kind of issue and then strengthening people's unconscious so that they're not being violated on a subliminal level. It's very, very important because uh, these, these subliminal artists and these subliminal uh, dictators, the people who are involved in this sort of psychic dictatorship, actually have the perfect right to do what they're doing. You're not going to be getting anywhere by knocking on the door going, please stop what you're doing, you guys are evil. In a way, they have the right to do whatever they want to do. It's our right to not buy into what they're doing, and it's our right to strengthen our immune system so their garbage has no effect. Once you are so strong that your enemy cannot defeat you, you've won. They have lost. This is the vital message that needs to get through. Michael, when I, I listened to you uh, talk about strengthening one's immune system, uh, I'm completely in agreement because, you know, there are uh, many people who are very proud of the fact that they do not watch television. They, they make it one of the uh, defining features of their identity, you know, that they don't watch TV and that they're not, their heads are not filled with all the fluff of people who watch television. And there was a time when I, uh, I identified myself like that, and I did not have a TV in my home. And I, uh, at the time, I, I would make a point of going over to a friend's house each week to, uh, to watch uh, Star Trek The Next Generation when it was still on and uh, to watch The X-Files a little later on. But um, when I had been without a TV for a long time, I found that my resistance to television completely disintegrated. That when I was in the presence of a television, I could not not watch it. I could not take my eyes off that moving image. That having been away from television for so long, it's as if the, uh, the regular sort of defense mechanisms that I think people erect to the, the sort of manipulation that television can impose just completely atrophied. <laughs> I was at the mercy of television whenever I was exposed to it. Yes, that can happen. Uh, it's different for every kind of person. And don't get me wrong, there are people who, you know, should turn it off. Uh, uh, they need that space. They need that silence. They need maybe to go back to books for a while, you know, listen to radio, uh, you know, uh, uh, go to the computer and look at things there. You know, I, I myself do not have a TV. But that doesn't mean I don't watch videos. You know, and, and during a lot of the best times when I've done tutorials, especially with children, we've made incredible use of the television. Because how are you going to instruct children in this deeply important symbolic language if in words, it's in some sort of, you know, picture, you know, bringing in sort of blow-ups and stuff like that. Okay, it works to a level. But I find when I taught the children symbolic communication, 
that it was actually the best thing to do was to show them videos. And I had I have a large library of you know stuff from Britain, British sci-fi, but we also went into normal movies, things that they're familiar with. We critiqued Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. You know, we went in there and we analyzed it, and we didn't do it you know uh, pedantically like we're right. We just said let's go in here, and, and and many times I would not even say anything. We'd watch something, we'd watch an episode of something, and particularly if it was very surreal. Uh, meaning that even the filmmaker had had made it surreal. He wasn't talking to your linear mind at all. There are such there are such creations, and then afterwards, you know, we'd sit there and there's maybe 20 kids, and they go, "Man, what was that all about?" And I go, "Well, that's why I was uh, hoping you would tell me actually, because I don't have a clue." So what I did is I downplayed my own sort of you know knowledge about it and said, "What what do you think it's about?" And that kind of approach, you know, over many years. And these kids were alive because these kids were only too happy to tell you what they thought it was about. And that didn't mean it was right. It didn't mean it meant makes sense. It, it was, but what it was doing was it was suddenly saying, "I am bringing from these children's unconscious, from their own brain, something to match what is you know being seen, which is a response to reality, which is what we want from life. We want to make critics, not cynics, out of our world." What you get with most people who are watching the television is that they want to be passive. They want to just be, you know, we are in a world in which we have to give, 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 morning, noon, and night. We give of our energy. We're slaves to the system. We give, give, give. So you cannot blame the person, you see, for wanting to sit down in a chair and just go, can I be given something tonight for a change? And that's what TV offers. I don't think there's necessarily anything sinister in it. It's just the way things are. It's the dynamic. And that, that dynamic can be changed in a second. Now, with these children... They were just thinking, oh, here comes this Irish guy. We know what we're going to get. He's just going to bash us like all these other teachers and our, our moms and dads do. Turn off the TV and tell us how wrong we are. And you could just see that written all over their faces, you know, uh, KMO, when, the, when I went in originally, when I first started doing this. Here we go again, more prohibition, more, you know, uh, thou shalt not. And I wheel out the videotape player and go, turn down the lights because we're going to watch commercials today, guys. And you could see, hey, what's this? Suddenly I had them engaged. You know, half the class would be sleeping. Now they're awake. And, and we'd watch commercials. We'd watch Adidas commercials. And we'd watch all that stuff with us throwing a light at you. And it's just so busy. And all that garbage coming at you. And what we did was we developed a response to that instead of a reaction. Turning off TV, throwing it in the dustbin is a reaction. It is not a response. Response is saying, here is something toxic, here is something deeply immoral, here is something that is going to prey upon my instincts, is going to prey upon my um, sexuality, and I refuse to let it do that. I, I alchemize it, I turn it around, I take the sorcery and I, and I respond to it with magic. And that's exactly what happened. And those were wonderful years, you know, and there was a great growth. And uh, there was many facets to this because the kids would also go around and literally uh, cut art things from magazines, you know, they kept scrapbooks of all the subliminal content. And so they proved to themselves beyond all shadow of a doubt that certain numbers are constantly used, certain images are constantly used. Uh, the, the, they became absolutely sharp on how women are being portrayed, how animals are being portrayed, how the machine is being portrayed, how the DNA is being portrayed, how aliens are being portrayed, and so forth and so on, you see. And this gave them, a, a, they became like little sh mini Sherlock Holmeses. Instead of being jaded cynics, these kids were like alive now because they had something to do. They became critics of their society. They became critics of all of this. The billboards, you know, uh, some girls in the class had actually taken out binoculars, KMO, to go and, and, and study big, giant billboards that contain a lot of subliminal information. These Bacardi billboards and these, uh, you know, um, vodka billboards, what have you, uh, the Nike billboard. They were actually studying through binoculars. I just turned these kids into like Baker Street Irregulars, man. Uh, and on a Monday when I used to walk in, they'd be deluging me with all the stuff they'd cut out and all the stuff they'd amassed and all their theories. I mean, it just became out of control. So there was an immediate transformation in a, in a matter of just weeks or months. Well, there's a, a couple different things that I want to touch on, and um, they're not obviously related. So I'll just sort of flip a mental coin to, to see which way to go. And... Um, it's come up tales, and I'm thinking of the tale of a mammoth. Um, when I first sent you an email several months ago to uh, talk about the possibility of your appearing on the Sea Realm podcast, I had just seen the new movie that had been released to DVD from Roland Emmerich. It's called 10,000 BC. 
And Roland Emmerich is famous for doing these uh, throwaway, vacuous popcorn films like Independence Day and Godzilla and uh, The Day After Tomorrow. And this 10,000 BC on the surface is is just that. You know, it's it's strictly fluff entertainment. It's about a, a man in the the Ice Age who his village is raided and he goes on an odyssey to rescue his people. And he ends up basically in Egypt where some foreigners have um, have coerced all of these people into building these great pyramids and temples to them. And the foreigners are... Uh, they're very tall and they're pale and they're they're shrouded and we don't know until the very end of the film if they're human or not. And I guess before I go any further, I'm wondering, have you seen the film? No, I haven't seen the film, but what you're talking about is very, very um, known to me. Uh, when we're talking about Egypt and how Egypt has been portrayed in most of the movies, and this goes right back even to the early epic films, uh, like the Ten Commandments, or, or other movies that have dealt with the Egyptian concept, you know, the sort of Technicolor 1950s movies, where they basically, it sounds like what your the director you mentioned, he's just re-spray painting exactly the same kind of movie that, you know, we first were exposed to back in the Cecil B. DeMille, and then post, you know, uh, Cecil B. DeMille era, in which these big spectaculars were made, the Samson and Delilahs, uh, you know, uh, movies like The Robe, uh, you know, and so forth and so on, the great uh, Technicolor spectacles. And uh, even then up into movies like Stargate, in which the Egyptians were, again, depicted appallingly in my uh, in my mind. And so, to, you know, like you asked in the previous segment, what can we do to, you know, in the beginning stages to study these things that you're talking about? That's exactly what I mean. By looking at those constant motifs of how particularly a group of people like the Egyptians would be constantly portrayed, you see, and is this some sort of propaganda? It, does it really match reality? You know, so again, yeah, this guy is obviously in the employ of these people who want to put out a meme, you know, I want to put out a, a sort of an, a, an idea. Uh, you have the same concept uh, very much in uh, Indiana Jones, you know, in which uh, when he's down in the tomb of the Egyptians, it's full of snakes. It's full of skulls, it's full of scorpions, it's full of evil things, you know. And the, even the portrayal of, uh, you know, the Kali cult, of the, of the mother goddess Kali, which was in the Temple of Doom, you know. So, I mean, where do we, where do we, where do we end with this, you know? When you, especially when you're dealing with Hollywood movies, this comic book, unrealistic, utterly prejudicial, utterly scandalous portrayal of very ancient civilizations and cultures, the idea that we in the West are super modern, they were primitive and backward and, and monstrous, you see. It, it's, these are the huge forms of imperialism and colonialization that I was talking about earlier on. That's why I forget that it's history. It is going on today. It's just that the medium of the colonization and the colonialization and the psychic pestilence has changed. It's just updated. It's just upgraded. It's just become technological. And it is going to continue in the next you know, five to ten years. It's going to continue until we call an end to it by not buying into that kind of, you know, uh, rubbish. One question that I, I pose to a number of guests here on the Sea Rome podcast is this. When we look at the, the legal and uh, business structures of corporations, we, we get a situation in which these corporations, these, uh, these sort of artificial life forms, are compelled just by their own structure and the structure of the law to behave like sociopaths. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a human sociopathic intent behind that creation. It could just be sort of a, a pattern that has emerged, a, a sort of natural selection working on the, the artificial life form of the corporation and other, other corporate power structures. And by corporate, I just mean collective uh, here on Earth. And you can take one of two worldviews. You can say... There, there is no evil intent behind the, uh, the structures that give rise to seemingly evil action. Or you can say that there is an evil and sinister intent, and it is one that was consciously uh, conceived and executed. And it seems that Occam's razor would lead us to eliminate the unnecessary entity, that is, the, uh, the deliberate conscious intent by some malevolent force, and just go with the idea that a lot of the evil we see in the world sort of emerges unconsciously, spontaneously, just from the structure of our organizations. And uh, I think that you subscribe to the, uh, the thought that there really is some malevolent agency in the world that is conscious and deliberate in its malevolence. Now, have I got that right? And if so, give us some of the details. Absolutely. 
I, my work is dedicated to exposing the fact that there is a malevolent, you know, force in the world. But you remember, I must insist that I am not a person who then my entire job is just to point fingers at some shadowy alien enclave, some uh, illuminist cadre, uh, some sort of uh, nebulous, you know, Masonic, you know, uh, brotherhoods. What I do is I talk about them. As I said, I go to the, their own works to make it absolutely clear that they exist and even what their agenda is, because these people have published it. This is the most amazing thing, and there's reasons why they do that. But to get back to your question, I do not, my work is not just about pointing fingers and giving us an us-them scenario. My work falls back on itself to say, if such tyranny exists, if such dictatorship exists, if such uh, submission exists in the world, then let's ask a much more important question as to why man lends himself to that, because that is precisely what is going on. And that is what I try to uh, make my audience look at. Not just that let's study them, let's diagnose them, you know, that, that, that's, that's important. But once you've established that there are these people doing these tyrannical things, and believe me, that's not as hard as it sounds. As I said, you only need to go to their own works. Because psychopaths are also egoists who love to let you know what they're doing. But once you've established that these groups exist, there's a far more fascinating question. Why do we permit it? What is it psychologically in man, you see, that allows him, that forces him to submit, to buy into things? Because some, 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 so, some goon may be selling you something. Doesn't mean you got to pay for it. Doesn't mean you got to buy it. And you see, so this is this is the focus of my work. That there, yeah, there is a form of tyranny. There is a there are mind control elements at work. But what is it in man that feels so um, weak in himself that he requires to submit to governments to these? Uh, you know, authorities, when in fact there are so many other wonderful, you know, ways that he could go. As you said, corporatization, monopolization of the world. It's, that can, that's a trail that can be dated. There's nothing nebulous or mysterious or occult about that. Most of the things that we're talking about that people label conspiratorial are actually very factual. Whether it's the New World Order, whether it is the um, wars that have been released in the world, whether it's been economic manipulation, you know, of the banks and, and the credit houses and, and of the, 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 the white market, meaning the stock exchanges of the world, that can be tracked. That is absolutely trackable. So a lot of this stuff is, you know, but you have to go on a forensic manhunt. You have to have the right tools. You know, trying to tell somebody that there's bacteria in the world before the uh, advent of the microscope is liable to have the whole village turn out to drag you to the square to burn you at the stake. If you said that a whole form of, uh, you know, ecology, a whole form of life exists on a, on a microscopic level and all these little things are moving around, I'm telling you, you'd be in bad shape. But along comes the microscope, and oh, okay, we accept it, no problem. Well, it's a certain kind of vision, partly intuitive, partly imaginative, and partly very rational, that, you know, we look into these other matters and we become acclimatized to understanding this. But yes, when it comes to corporatization, has not Joel Bacan, the author of the book, The Corporation, shown that corporations are basically based on a psychopathic profile. So people from the top of the academic totem pole have already you know, delved deeply into this matter. The etymology, corp, corporation, corpus, is a dead thing. You know, you're working for a dead thing. Uh, do you want a dead thing operating over you? The, some, of the, some of the very language, you know, uh, which uh, my mentors have obviously gone into, the, the language around money, the language around banking, the, the language around law. Is, is fascinating in itself. There's a whole study of the subtextual connotative meanings of, the, of some of the terms. We have books like Death by Government, in which people need to pick up these books. There's a, you mentioned a great author earlier on in the first segment uh, of a show we did in the past, and you know I can also bring to bear this book called Death by Government, again written by academic, who, who's literally showing you that in casualty statistics throughout the ages, it has been people within the territory that the government has picked on. They have murdered more of their own people than ever died, statistically speaking, in foreign wars. So governments are on record, slaughter more of their own people from their own nations, from their own states, than they ever do when they're fighting externally. And so this is already proven, you see. The evil does exist. Genocide is a reality. The slaughter of nations is a reality. The ecocide that's taking place towards nature and towards animals every single day of the week is a reality. Just because we become acclimatized to it and acculturated to it and don't think of it as evil or negative, well, that doesn't change the fact of the matter. 
And our ancients didn't live like that. The creative force did not, you know, create our life to be like this. Far from it. Man has so much more potential. But you see, there's a great statement in the, in the work of Conan Doyle, in which he has his character Sherlock Holmes say something of such monumental importance uh, in OKMO that I refer to it constantly in my work because my work emphasizes a lot to do with deconstruction. And he has his Sherlock Holmes character say this, the truth is only arrived at. The truth is only exposed after the painstaking elimination of what is not true. This was also echoed by the great philosopher Krishnamurti, who, who said that when the lie is not, the truth is. It's a deconstructive model. It is an apophatic approach. It is a super rational uh, attitude. It is deductive. It is inductive, you see. It is objective. It is non-partisan. It is non-biased. It is loving. People keep talking about love. Well, this is a thing of love. To be able to look at a particular species of butterfly, you see, and to learn all there is about it, like an entomologist does. To study the mysteries of, uh, you know, the stardust, plasma cosmology, technology, uh, all things that require a man's passion, a man's interest. So, also, we have to understand that somebody's not just going to come and present us truth on a platinum tray. Your mind, one week at a time. You're listening to the Sea Realm Podcast, and I'm talking with Michael Tesserion. And, Michael, when you are uh, talking, you throw out a lot of questions, and I take them to be rhetorical questions or questions that are just intended to orient someone's uh, mind in a sort of inquisitive way rather than uh, in, you know, in a position of being a passive receiver of information. But there is one rhetorical question that I'd like you to go back to, and uh, if you would give us what you think at least the beginning of an answer is. And that question is, what is it about our constitution or about our psychology as humans that makes us want to submit, that makes us ideal candidates for collecting into these large structures which serve ends which are, are not in our own interests? Well, to answer part one of your question is why I put out a lot of questions and rhetorical questions. The simple answer to that is because I am a questioner. I am absolutely a questioner. I question and doubt everything. That's the simple answer to that. Some are rhetorical and some are, you know, the normal kind. They get on to the more uh, deeper question that you're asking there. You know, that has to deal with what is referred to in uh, existential philosophy as the authentic or inauthentic life. Uh, these terms arise out of a philosopher from Denmark called Soren Kierkegaard and then picked up by people like uh, Heidegger, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, etc., in which they talked about m two kinds of men. The man who lives an authentic life, uh, which would be an Eastern mysticism known as the Dharmic life, and the man who's inauthentic, and that's the Karmic life. So when we look around the world, we see these two kinds of people. And the, the problem is that in the inauthentic model, there's tremendous second, uh, there's primary guilt. Guilt, not of the kind that we normally know when we do some little misdemeanor or we've heard some you know, person's feelings or whatever, that type of nonsense. That's just secondary guilt, lesser guilt. There is an existential guilt based on your own inner subconscious commitment to live an inauthentic life. And from that guilt and from that commitment to live the inauthentic life comes an entire inverted tree of life of many, many other syndromes, you know, and many other complexes that we're familiar with in the world. One of those branches, one of those symptoms is then man's penchant to submit. Uh, because the answer to your question in one single sentence is this. Man has found it more satisfactory, and believe me, this is irrational, but nevertheless he's made this irrational decision. As irrational as it is, he's made a decision rather to submit to external forms of tyranny, external forms of control, which are partly punitive, but also partly permissive, I mean, the slave is going to have some food, and he's going to have some shelter, and he'll be told what to do. You know, and he'll have the camaraderie of other slaves and so on. So the slave mentality, the man who submits, has in fact chosen to submit to external authorities, regardless of how tyrannical they are, rather than face the journey on the Siddhartha road towards an understanding and a, a, an attainment of his own selfhood. This might be difficult for people to understand who are not familiar with psychology, we're not familiar with, you know, spirituality. But 
even in Christian terms, you find this, the same teachings that you, you either have the truth or you have the non-truth. You have submittance to the, the world of the debauchery or whatever you want to call it, to the lower drives, to the lower instincts, you know, to the lower man. So this is the this is the nub of it. And I've done you know interviews and, and we've talked about this in the DVDs, and we very much talk about it in the Architects of Control series. That here is a man who is committed within a subconscious to not live an authentic life. Then he wants to cluster with others who've made the similar decision. And that's what we have in societies, is an inauthentic, you know, collective. But it's based out of people who would rather submit to the external tyrannies of Big Daddy, who would rather cling to the handrails, who would rather lean on one another, than face the anxiety that arises when you have to go on the inner journey of truth, when you have to discover what you're really here for on this planet, and who you are yourself. Alan Watt, the great, uh, you know, Zen commentator, always said that there's a taboo against knowing who you are. Jung commented on it, Freud commented on it, Nietzsche commented on it, Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, they all mentioned this falling away from actual selfhood. We know what makes us the same as everybody else. All the institutions want to drum it into us, what makes us uniform and the same. We're very rarely taught, except by true teachers, what it is that makes us unique. Because the system isn't interested in really what makes us unique, except in a sort of a topical way, in order to keep the slave busy. But when it comes to real psychological and spiritual sovereignty, they're not interested. And that is the reason why we do not have so political sovereignty. That is why it's eroded. That's why we don't have social sovereignty. That is why that is being eroded. It's because man does not have, nor does he even want, for the most part, psychological, moral, intellectual sovereignty. So the Ayn Rands are unread. The Alan Watts's are unread. They're forgotten. The psychologists are forgotten, except when it's the, it's the most topical spinner rack rubbish in order just to keep a sort of spring cleaning on your normal inauthentic existence. Because remember, dust gathers and everything, rust will accumulate. So even in the best of lives, you're going to feel a little anxiety, a little frustration, a little you know hang-ups with your boyfriend, girlfriend, all the roles. The roles need maintenance. The roles need jump starts. So we have just enough psychology, just enough New Age gimmickry, just enough incense-waving towel-head shaman from the East, you know, snake-charming BS, just enough of the, that fake shamanistic nonsense, not the real thing at all, to spray paint, to refresh, you see, to upgrade the inauthentic life. So the study of the inauthentic life is the study of the, uh, and, and the opposite man, the man who's authentic, is what we refer to as the outsider. He is trying to handle you know, the journey within. He is cutting through the briars and the bushes. He is traveling the, the road less traveled. He is inner directed. He's not waiting for the world to turn him on and give meaning to his life because he realizes that he has to give meaning to the life. He is the one who realizes that it's not experiences that have to be constantly fresh and new, but the mind of the experiencer that must be always refreshed and anew. But the rest of the mankind does not want that. They're dead. They're morally dead or they're spiritually dead, saying, world, turn me on. Give me more stimuli, give me more things, give me more stuff. And so what we have now in the modern world is an infantile level of, of you know, development, spiritually and mentally, in which we just sit there hoping that the world is going to turn us on. And you know something? Big Brother is exactly what Big Brother wants to hear. Because those are the manufacturers of the lie. Those are the manufacturers of all the things that the narcissistic personality type demands. I've often said in my work that the ego is the, is the um, ghost that rose out of the grave of the self. And so only a return to selfhood is going to deal with the narcissistic self, is going to, you know, uh, balance the ego drives. You see, you can't, you can't troubleshoot it in an external way, sort of, you know, with a hammer and tongs. It's only when you, like Buckminster Fuller said, replace that system. And so a return to selfhood, individually, in a, in a psychological context, is the only remedy to all the other issues, be they political or social. I understand what those problems are, I study them myself, and I also know what their remedy is. But the remedy is in consciousness. It is the change of a man's consciousness that changes the rest of the world. And any other teacher, and there are many, be it the Tim Freakies or whoever it might be, who are trying to lead you away from that true sense of independence. These are the Pied Pipers of Doom who are promising you global villages and global utopias and brotherhoods of man and, and, and you know, global diversity and multiculturalism and all the other nonsense that they you know, 
put in front of you. But what you've got to realize is that they're planting those, the foundations of that global village, right on top of selfhood. They're putting it on the death, the corpse of selfhood. And so these people are pied pipers of doom. But the man who's already abnegated his selfhood, who's already in the absence of being, isn't he going to follow those people? Isn't he going to listen to those, the flute? And like, the rats and the children who followed the Pied Piper, isn't he going to get in line as soon as he hears those clarion calls, which is exactly what you see in the world today? Because the greatest threat in our world is the selfless human being, the man who has no sense of who he is, no, he's absolutely, everything about him is conditioned by the world. He's just a role player. Not that roles are wrong, but they are wrong if they've taken the place of the authentic development, the authentic selfhood. And so from the parents to the schools to the priests and politicians, that's why you have that 100% you know, um, dis the despise of selfhood and the crushing and the suppression of all forms of independence wherever you get it. That's why you have a media that sells you these kinds of models and sells you this pornographic nonsense and puts in front of you these theories that, you know, are about you losing your selfhood, immersing yourself in something that's, again, uniform in order to belong, in order to have approval. And of course, since in life, the way it works, you don't get the approval. So then we have now what? A neurotic individual, uh, an individual who doesn't know whether he's coming or going, an individual who has to go to alcohol, an individual who has to go to gossip, an individual who has to take medications, an individual who's perpetually lost and perpetually out of control or super involved in the lives of other people or smother mothers. You see, or people who have to be constantly voyeuristic or constantly working all the time, which is a problem that you have in America of the culture of just work, 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 so that you're avoiding the voice within. You're avoiding coming to who you really are. You're losing yourself in the role or people who've given themselves over to some God in the sky concept, which is what we know as religion. I'm not good enough. I'm a sinner. I'm too little. Let me give myself to the guru. <clears throat> Let me give myself to, you know, this projected higher man. There's a million and one ways in which man is escaping from his, from his authentic existence. And until there's a radical change in that field, you see, we're not gonna, we, we cannot hope to see change in other areas. All you will see is more um, decoration and more upgrading of the room of the inauthentic life, period. Michael, that was absolutely marvelous. And that was uh, exactly the sort of material I was hoping to get when I invited you onto the Sea Realm podcast in the first place. We are just about out of time, but let me ask you if we can end on a hopeful note, because I think a, a common narrative of people who listen to the Sea Realm podcast is that more and more people are dissatisfied with the uh, the bread and circuses that are thrown out that are meant to stimulate and distract and keep people in the inauthentic life, and they are looking for something more authentic. And the, uh, the new organizational tools that we talked about earlier are allowing these people to communicate in a way that they couldn't do before. Before we had the one-to-many communications and the, uh, the corporate entertainment meisters were telling us that most people are completely satisfied with these distractions and that's all they really want. And the voice of the people who are dissatisfied and longing for something more authentic was marginalized and was just not presented. And now we're finding out that that was a lie and people are finding their voice. And that is a very hopeful narrative, and I wonder if it is one that you also subscribe to. I, I, I subscribe to it 100%. My message, uh, and I've even said this live to audiences, and I've seen the responses, uh, because remember, who is, it that, who is it basically that comes to talks by people like myself? Is the outsiders. Is the people who, the moment that they've mentioned chemtrails, fluoride, vaccinations, or anything that really matters in this world have been looked like like they are absolutely ready for the funny farm all right so we're getting these people and they're coming in and what i'm seeing is a good thing is that the, you know they're okay with their difference a lot of people are kind of handling it but i do get you know emails and communications from people who are really under the weather they're not able to handle it they feel ostracized they feel lonely they feel you know misunderstood of course my message to them is what the hell are you wasting your time wondering what other people thinking of you it's that you're still caught in that i need approval from other people and if i'm not going to get it i'm, I'm a damaged you know and, and mutilated person snap out of it what does it matter what they think that's my basic message but more to get to the heart of your question yeah my message is to my audience is if you are not feeling all right with all the stuff that is going along going on in the world you are actually healthy and you're doing absolutely fine 
So no matter what happens to you, you know, with your nightmare fears, no matter how disenchanted you may feel, underlying those complexes and syndromes is a deeper voice going, you know something, you are sane. Because as bad as it is to face these issues, it is better to see it because at least by seeing it and the fact that you do see it, that's a testimony that you're doing okay. It's the same thing like a doctor on a battlefield. It's the same like a surgeon in a state of tremendous dis-ease. At least he can see it, but that's the only chance you're going to get to be able to diagnose the problem, you see, and then heal. So my message is all these people who feel very, you should feel piteous about what has taken place. You should not feel all right with a rotten status quo. You should feel angry and you should feel mad as hell. And if you're against it, always realize that is an affirmation of your own sanity. What you, it's like uh, Howard Zinn said, disobedience and rebellion is not our problem. Obedience is our problem. And we've got to realize that, you know, this, this kind of slavery is no longer valid. Or what you're going to see in the, as we move down towards 2012, you're going to see a parting of the ways. You're going to see some people who cannot ever in any way commit to the authentic life, and therefore they're going to go through to the inauthentic model. Okay? The waves will just part, and one group is just going to simply be heading down a very dark road towards some kind of post-human dystopia, which we have talked about you know, in the Architects of Control series. And then you're going to have the other people that you just described, who are able to find their center again, as Joseph Campbell said, to find your bliss, or as other mystics have said, to find the still point. And this is happening. There are people who are managing to do this. And in a way, the feedback loop with that is in one way, you kind of can be all right with some of the, the tribulations that are going on. Because ultimately speaking, if the tribulations that are happening in this world assist people not only to be shaken up, but to be woken up and to find their center again, both spiritually and morally, you know something? In the end, that's a good thing. You know, one of my mentors, um, the Christian writer, um, George MacDonald, he said, if the end of your road is good, then all the steps upon that journey and that road also become good, even that which was bad. But if the end of your road is darkness and lack of light and failure and, and bad, then all the other steps upon your road of your journey, inclu including the good, are ruined. Michael Tessarion, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the Sea Realm podcast, and uh, I will provide links to your website in the show notes for this episode, and uh, just remind people that they can find a lot more of your audio material in the archives of the Red Eyes Creations program, and you also appeared on Mike Hagan's Radio Orbit, and there's a, a long conversation that they can find with you there, and also in the uh, the archives of the Chronicles of the Psychonautilus. So, folks who are uh, really set on fire by what you're saying, and I'm sure there will be quite a few of them, have a lot more material that they can uh, find and digest, and I, I encourage them to do so. So thank you very much for providing everything that you have uh, injected into the ongoing conversation here at the Sea Realm. You're most welcome, Camo. Thank you for the time again. Talk later. That was author and filmmaker Michael Tessarion, and he was really just getting rolling there when I had to cut him off, and I was sort of sorry to do that, but uh, there's only so much material that I can pack here into the Sea Realm podcast. Michael, I'm sure, will be back sometime in the future, probably in 2009. I know for some that is good news, for others not so much, but uh, in the meantime I will have a variety of other guests on familiar topics and new topics, and there will be something there for just about everybody who likes the Sea Realm podcast. And with that, I will sign off by saying that this episode and every episode of the Sea Realm podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share-alike 3.0 license, and that it is available for your use. Next week, I will be playing a conversation that I recorded with uh, what I would like to call an informed representative of consensus reality. So join me for that, and until that time, stay well. <laughs>